Hello, this is We're Not Wizards Presents Brainwaves. Brainwaves is a topical news based podcast all about the world of board games and tabletop. And if you're interested and like what you hear, then please click on the show notes and give them a subscription and give them a follow across their various social medias. Um, if you have a podcast and you would like to be featured on our We Are Not Wizards Presents specials, then please get in contact. But now, on with the show. Jamie, what are we going to do? The HQ is cracking at the seams. There is so much news. The news tubes are full. They're getting clogged. There's interns getting lost in piles of paper. I have no idea where Ian is. He's under some of this somewhere. I'm, I'm, I'm... Ian, the, inertial, the news inertial dampener can't work anymore. It's ridiculous. We're doomed. J- Jamie, have you, what, what, what's, what's, what's happened to you? You seem to have become Scotty meets Dad's army. I've, I've, it's a bad Scottish accent because my real Scottish accent isn't real enough, apparently. Don't worry, Ian. I'm, I'm no miracle worker, but I'm doing the best I can. Look, 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 Jamie, it's, it's fine. We'll, we'll get the interns to put some, like, you know, um, paper mache on the outside of the HQ. That should keep the integrity going while we go to the studio. We'll deal with the cast, get the news levels down, and hopefully that'll resolve everything. And by then, the cast, we won't have exploded. Yeah, but you can't break the laws of game physics. You can't can't just put papier mache on it and call that a Kickstarter exclusive miniature. Well, I'm sure some companies have tried. <clears throat> Hi, sorry, don't know what happened there. Hello, it's me. It's Jamie Adams. Hi there, and I'm with Ian McAllister. Hello there, everyone, and this is Brainwaves episode fifty-three, bringing you the best in board game and tabletop gaming news. These are the headlines for the week of twentieth of July, twenty twenty. The bell tolls again. Wizards conjure up more controversy. An old Lang sigh as prominent games designer gets suspended from Twitter. All this and more on this episode of Brainwaves. I would like to go into the headlines, but that pun was both dreadful and amazing, so I've got to give you props for that, Ian. Thank you. It's uh, my basically one job around here. Well, you say you're one job. Anyway... Yes, on with the headlines. First one. Now, we have talked a number of times about Golden Bell Studios. Boo. Uh, Ian, please, impartiality here, please. They've had many various dealings with games companies on, regarding Kickstarter, and now they've decided to forgo Kickstarter completely and set up their own crowdfunding site called The Giving Tree. Now, Golden Bell have previously been banned entirely from the Kickstarter platform due to Numerous violations. I think when we covered it last, it was to do with the Unbroken Kickstarter that had all sorts of problems with fulfillment and Golden Bell have been involved in some really big fulfillment issues through Kickstarter and Kickstarter eventually just got fed up with them and kicked them from the site. And they've also been banned from Board Game Geek for basically threatening legal action against people in forums. Well then, well, they have their own crowdfunding site now. Part of the new platform includes a rather strict contract which uh, locks partners into a perpetual inability to criticise Golden Bell. I can't even begin to imagine why they'd want that, Jamie. There are only a few projects up on the site right now, mostly for tie-in merchandising for shows like Lost. Well, you know, hit that up-to-date market. Nice one, Golden Bell. All the projects so far are from Golden Bell themselves. And uh, I had a... We quick look through the projects just before we started recording there's a few backers for each one and a lot of them are ongoing campaigns which is sounds kind of like pre-ordering product yeah there, there's i had a wee look around the site and there's a lot of like big donations from very few people to make projects look complete and this is obviously pure speculation on my part but it doesn't it looks a bit weird i mean it, it's the sort of thing you just like if you saw on kickstarter you think it's a bit weird so yeah, I am not sure. Obviously, we're going to uh, say here at Brainwaves that you should avoid the site at all possible costs because Golden Bell don't deliver properly and are really litigious and just not a very nice company to work with by all accounts. I was going to be a bit more diplomatic and say they have a slightly storied reputation, but 
the uh, opinions of Ian McCall's do not necessarily represent those of the giant brain and brainwaves as a whole. If you have any uh, complaints or correspondence, please mail them to at Ian McAllister. Speaking of Ian McAllister, <laughs> Ian, I believe you've got a story now. On our last cast, we mentioned Wizards of the Coast a couple of times with their diversity statement and also parting ways with a particular artist after accusations of sexual harassment. The Wizards have experienced a few more employee troubles of recent. On July the 3rd, Wizards of the Coast employee Orion Black announced on Twitter that they had quit their job. Orion is a black non-binary writer and was working for Wizards for about five months. Orion issued a statement relating to their own experiences on working on Dungeons and & Dragons and calling out the company's recent diversity statement that we reported on. The statement is pretty long, so we're not going to read it in full. We'll obviously link it to our show notes. In summary, though, Orion said that engaging on social media with people that were critical of Wizards of the Coast could lose you your job, that they had to go looking for jobs to do within the company, and that they were not wor- nurtured like other white writers. Uh, some of their work was stolen, that wizards do not listen to the voices of those who call them to task on issues of a diversity and representation, and then release a statement saying they have to do better on such matters. Orion's statement got a show of support from all over the gaming community, including that of Greg Tito, who's Wizards Senior Communication Manager. Tito expressed regret for the way things had gone down at WotC, and that it was being taken to the highest levels of the company, quoting from his tweet. A conversation between Tito and Sharif Jackson, who's the DM of popular actual play podcast and show Rivals of Waterdeep, revealed frustration from Tito at Wizards' lack of diversity at the top of the company, a conversation he has been trying to have for many years. This is not the only time Wizards has come under fire for its lack of diversity and inclusivity in recent months. At the start of June, Zayam Beg, a prominent Magic the Gathering personality, formerly of Channel Fireball, released a statement accusing the company of further racist leanings in their hiring and creative practices. Watsi have issued an apology to Orion on July 10th, naming them specifically, which kind of indicates that they are aware what happened was not acceptable. That said, their apology has been considered to not go far enough at this stage by a lot of prominent figures in the Dungeons & Dragons community, with many calling for actions and not words. We'll bring you further updates as the story evolves. Lots of controversy coming out of Wizards right now. They've released statements. They have recently, for just today, we found out they were looking for a senior manager of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Put a link to that in the show notes and you can read exactly what they're looking for. Whether that's an actual move to make some things happen within Wizards or just for show, that's up to folk, for folk to speculate. Hopefully, as more of these statements come out as wiz- more pressures put on wizards they will change their attitudes they will change their hiring practices within and by the sounds of it some of their actual operational practices inside the company yeah we will bring you more on that as the story evolves well if nothing changes then there will be some more vocal backlashes from the community and it could you know could go far as thing like boycotting of wizards of the coast products or just you could you could see a notable drop if if the things they say they're going to do don't happen. Yeah, and because Dungeons and Dragons is so reliant right now, I mean it's so popular, but it's so reliant on on streamers, uh, and YouTube stars, and, and podcasts and actual play to to be out there and be visible and and be bought. If that community rails against it because of what they're not doing, then that could be very bad for Wizards in the long run. Jamie, there's been prominent game designers being booted off Twitter for a brief period of time. It has been quite a quite a controversy. Now, on the 8th of July, uh, the designer Eric Lang, who is head of design at Cool Mini or Not Games and creator of such games as Blood Rage, Rising Sun, and the soon-to-be-released Ank. Now, he has done a lot of other ones as well. He's done, for example, XCOM, the board game which uh, I think Sam told me was very, very good. He, he mentioned it at some point on his multi-dimensional transition. I played XCOM on board game and it is good. I, I would like to try some more Eric Lang games. I don't know how many I've actually played. Anyway, Eric Lang's Twitter account was, I believe the term is soft blocked. It was suspended, basically. Now, in a post on Facebook after the ban was lifted, Eric Lang said that he had been banned because of a concerted effort by a particularly toxic Twitter account and its followers mass reporting him. Now, in a post on Facebook after his ban was lifted, Eric Lang said that he'd been banned because of a concerted effort by a particularly toxic 
Twitter account and its followers were being used to mass report him. Now, he'd been picking up followers from this account and being a person of colour, recognised that the best thing to do was to mass block them before things got out of hand. In doing so, he warned his followers that this was happening, at which time things began to happen and the dogpiling occurred. Now, this is... This is not a new instance of of people of colour, women, LGBTQ plus individuals who are subject to this kind of harassment. And I will speak for everyone at Brainwaves and the Giant Brain, and this is appalling. Yeah, absolutely. Just absolutely horrible behaviour. We're not obviously we're not naming the Twitter account that uh, was responsible for the dogpile on Eric. If you go and look, well. We'll be sharing Eric's post from Facebook, but if you go and look around the internet, you will be able to find out what happened quite happily, but we're not going to give them the air of publicity. Uh, the, the Facebook posts are worth reading. Eric is very, very good about writing about this kind of thing because he's had decades of dealing with this kind of thing himself, unfortunately, so he writes very well about it. I would like to read from the very last part of his first post that described what happened. And to serial harassers and trolls, listen up. You are insignificant. You are powerless, boring, predictable, and pitiful. And at the end of the day, you do not matter. Well, after some quite heavy headlines there, let's head into the news. And our first bit is a little update on a story we previously covered in episode 42. In that episode, we talked about a dispute between Mythic Games and Pascal Bernard, author of Time of Legends, Joan of Arc. In an update on 15th of July, Mythic Games announced an agreement had been reached between the two parties. They cannot go into details, but the 1.5 version of the rulebooks and all associated bits and pieces will be released either late this year or early next year. The original uh, dispute was pretty complex, uh, involving multiple companies, buying of companies, all sorts of things. But the nub of the matter was that Pascal had a contract that said he had rights to confirm rules changes for the release of the 1.5 version of Joan of Arc. And more importantly, he was due 6% of the net sales of the game. Obviously, we don't know exactly what the agreement has now been that's allowed them to move forwards. Uh, we'll bring you a wee update if we hear anything more. Jamie, a famous artist, has unfortunately passed away. Yes, I'm afraid to say that the artist and illustrator Jim Holloway has sadly passed away. Now, he was a self-taught artist and illustrator, which is wow, flippin' impressive. Uh, he's done art for role-playing games such as several uh, editions of Dungeons & Dragons, Paranoia, Battletech, and Spelljammer. I think I know his art best from Spelljammer. Um, You're a big fan of that game, aren't you? I, I only played one campaign of it, but I flippin' loved it. And I think it's really nice, evocative art. Um, I could go into a Spelljammer rant or not rant but I talk about spell jam but I'm not going to because this is not the time but the art of Jim Holloway Facebook group which is run by his son uh, has asked fans to share their favorite illustrations and to really show the the outpouring of respect and love that he garnered throughout his storied career and I thought so with the family at the time of course and Jim Holloway you will be missed Indeed, some excellent illustrations and our thoughts with his family at this difficult time. Jamie, on to some awards news. You do love yourself some awards news. Well, it's my my niche in the podcast, isn't it? I am I am the awards and finance man, it seems. Uh, it has been the Dice Tower Awards, the 13th Dice Tower Awards, uh, as part of the recent Dice Tower Summer Spectacular. Now, the winners were arrived at after voting from over 70 contributors to the Dice Tower network. Now, I'm pretty sure Dice Tower is the biggest board game network on on YouTube, I would say. It's one of the, you know, one of the pantheon. It it must be because it's not like a single individual or like two or three individuals, like something like Shove and Sit Down or No Pun Included. It's... It's massive. They're putting out content pretty much all the time. I think I think at one point Tom Vassell basically stated that their aim was to make sure every single board game that releases is covered, and they must come pretty close to that with the level with the level of contribution they have. Tell you what, that is a very bold statement. Yeah, and you you can applaud their efforts for that. It's a bold ambition, and they certainly do put out a lot of content, a lot of different people on there. For the Dice Tower Awards, nothing really sweeps the board, which has actually been quite interesting because we have seen several other games, you know, various games sweep it recently. 
but there's a good selection of games. There's, you know, very uh, heavier strategy games, big production, and the smaller, lighter, kind of almost filler games. Not really, but it's a really nice, nice wide kind of range. Now, Wingspan did win the most awards, including Game of the Year and Best Game from a New Designer. One of our favourites, Watergate, won the best two-player game, which I'm pretty happy about because I love that. And I'd like to make, I'd also like to make comment of Parks winning best artwork. Now, Parks is a game that Ian C and I have played uh, and quite enjoyed. Actually, yeah, it, it was a quite a mellow kind of Takedo esque vibe in that it's relaxing but also quite cutthroat, and the art of the various national parks is part of a an art project i suppose from various artists and and some of them are just gorgeous i mean we played the game and then we spent a good 20 minutes afterwards going let's look at all the parks wow some of these are amazing a lot of them were so jamie is is that cheating using art from like a massive art project in your board game and then getting the best artwork award is that, is that cheating <laughs> Some might argue yes, but also there is also the artwork of the game itself, which is not part of the art project uh, and is gorgeous as well. And it's really lovely and evocative themes, you know, very stark contrast between, say, the howling desert uh, and like the lovely waterfall or something like that. So there can be an argument made, but I would also go, well, look at the game itself, the pieces they're gorgeous. I haven't played Parks yet. I'd really like to because, yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of good things about it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a little critical of the Dice Tower from time to time, but I really like the set of awards. There's a lot of good categories in there. covers a wide range of things. And like we, Jamie said at the top, it, it's a good range of games. There's there's light stuff, there's heavy stuff, there's there's small games, there's big games. There's all sorts of things in there. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really good list of awards. It's all from 2019, by the way, so it's all board games that are released in 2019. Um, so yeah, go and check that out and see if you might find your next favourite game in there. I'd like to make just a small addendum to what you said. You know, you can be a little bit critical of the Dice Tower. I think you should be critical of everything, even the things you really like. Yeah. Because it, it, it build for me anyway, I think it builds a, a more rounded viewpoint that just going, I like this, why? Because I like it. But if you go, why do you like it? Why? What do you yeah. not like about it? And go, well, you know, that that's fair enough because hey, the world would be really boring if everyone liked the same thing. That's why I write about board games and I, I write reviews of board games. I, I love board games, therefore I I criticise them, I critique them, and I look, I look at them do, through that lens. Do you, Ian? Wait, you, you like board games. Have you ever thought about doing a podcast or something? Nah. Well, nah, the, fair enough. These chats aren't recorded, right? No, no. Only you, I, the Russians, uh, the Chinese, and MI6 is listening. Fantastic. Hi, chaps. How you doing? So, Ian, yes, it, don't worry, not being recorded, but uh, recorded is a pretty good score on Scrabble, isn't it? It's not amazing, but it's quite good. Yes, it's a very good score, but at least it's not offensive, because Scrabble is now banning a bunch of words for being offensive. They are banning 225 words from competitive Scrabble tournaments. This is the result of an agreement between Hasbro and North American Scrabble Players Association, or NASPA, which I didn't realise existed and pleases me no end, the group solely responsible for the rules and governance regarding competitive Scrabble around the world. The sole group. Yeah. So if you do any competitive Scrabble, and some people give Scrabble a hard time, you know, some people understandably, but also it's really popular. Oh, yeah. And world Scrabble, I mean, come on. I mean, whenever we talk about board game sales and a, a hobby game selling well, it's, it must be nothing in comparison to Scrabble sales or Monopoly sales or whatever. Just massively above. Anyway. Uh, Words fail me. Well, then you'd be terrible at Scrabble, wouldn't you? I am. Hasbro hasn't printed any slurs or offensive words in their Scrabble dictionaries since 1994. While NASPA controls the word list for tournaments, Hasbro are the ones who provide the lexicon that forms the basis for all versions of Scrabble. Now, that also includes digital versions as well. Yeah. So because it, because it means that they've now come to an agreement... You know, it could see that uh, digital versions will also see these words, hopefully, being dropped as well. Does it mean we'll get special digital versions with all the naughty words in it? Well, I believe it's is it September 1st is when the big change will happen. Uh, so you have until then. You have until then to spell arse on a Scrabble board. That's one of them. I thought you said this was a family-friendly podcast and you're polluting with this filth from your mouth. If only they hear what isn't recorded. 
In the 1990s, anti-Semitic terms were removed from the Scrabble Dictionary after the Anti-Defamation League successfully lobbied Hasbro. Nice little fact there. Uh, the words will, yeah, as Jamie says, the words will no longer be playable in sanctioned Scrabble games from September the 1st, 2020. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, Jamie, a little closer to home, or well, more accurately, a little closer to my home, uh, there is some things being cooked up in a lab. Yes, games being cooked up in a lab, a games lab in Edinburgh. It's called the Edinburgh Games Lab. <laughs> Funny that. The Edinburgh, I know, it's, ama- it's, oh, it's amazing. Set my segues, amazing. The, the way that people name things just blows me away every time. Yes, based at Edinburgh University's School of History, Classics and Archaeology, we have the History and Games Lab. Now, their aim is to explore games, both analogue and digital, as a medium for historical research, teaching, and public understanding of history. Through regular seminars, podcasts, workshops, game design, playtests, and participation at gaming events. Now, the History and Games Lab strives both to embed gaming into the courses that they offer at the School of History, Classics, and Archaeology, and to study how games represent historical themes. Now, as well as historical game studies within historical methodology, being uh, a part of the MSc in history that is offered, the History and Games Lab is soon going to be offering a postgraduate course in historical game design, which is going to be taught in conjunction with Edinburgh Futures Institute. Now, they also have a, currently have a Kickstarter project on the run called Fall of the King, I believe about a battle in, oh, 1249. I'm going to embarrass myself and assume that. Let's see if it is 1249... 1249. Well done. The Battle of the Battle of Fossalta, a key event in the crusade against the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And interestingly, that Kickstarter mentions a game system, uh, so it looks like they might have something established that allows them to investigate other historical battles using the same game system. Yes, it's the Ventura Battle System. And I believe, uh, in fact, I've had this confirmed that our friends at Bad Cat Games, who are a local games company, uh, are involved with this. So they've been helping out uh, yes. run some sort of seminars and uh, sort of playtest sessions and that kind of thing. I, I, I would love to have them on the podcast, I have to say, Ian. I, I first heard about it from Bad Cat about four or five months ago, and it's been at the back of my mind to do something with that information. So now they're sort of up and running. Yeah, I think it'd be interesting to get them on and talk about sort of the role of games and teaching and history and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, we'll, de- we'll definitely do that. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it's quite an easy question, but I'd like to ask them about GMT games because mm, you know, yeah, as as GMT games is kind of shtick is take moments from history, make a game out of them. Indeed, for for better, you know, better or for ill. But yeah, I want I want to see how how they found the different games, the different systems. You know, there are like the coin systems for Fire in the Lake, for example. Yeah. Um, is for teaching. You know, for example. Uh, I mean, that's kind of historical games. Yeah. But it is history, so I'm talking rubbish. Uh, compared to something like 1960, Making of a President. Now, that wasn't GMT made, but I know it's, it's part now under GMT games. So, Or something like Watergate we were talking about earlier, which has got some yeah, exactly. obviously historical context and, and does teach a little bit as it goes. So, yeah, that's really good stuff. But, yeah, hopefully. Hopefully we might have uh, them on the podcast very soon. And if not, um, I might see if i can nip over to edinburgh when things come down and go hi uh interview or actually you know what ian you live in edinburgh you could go and interview them anyway ian you've got some news from the gaming empire that is asmodee yes hot fresh news just out of the oven we just learned about this about half an hour before we came on to record my fingers on it yeah it it might set fire to the big piles of paper that around here it's really quite hot Uh, so earlier today so that's the 16th of july asmodee have announced that they are buying the french publisher libelud i hope i pronounced that correctly Uh, they are responsible for such smash hits as dixit and mysterium uh, Régis Bonasset, the founder of Liblud, told the press, For 12 years, we've been developing innovative games to inspire people's imaginations to share and dream, ultimately leading to the creation of unique universes. The Asmodee Group is a partner with whom we have been working since the beginning of our adventure, and which shares our values. We are very proud that Liblud joins the great Asmodee family, with many exciting new products ahead of us. Bonasset is leaving Liblud as a result of the deal, with Matteo Aber taking over. I hope I've pronounced everyone's names right in that. So, yeah, Asmodee continues to expand. Obviously, we've seen a couple of companies come away from Asmodee this year. And, yeah, it's interesting to see them shifting focus, taking on 
uh, some new publishers and we'll see what that brings in the rest of the year and especially if you've got the gaming juggernaut that is dixit yeah actually and and the gaming juggernaut that is mysterium now i'm ashamed to haven't played mysterium uh, and i've only played dixit once uh, but i played it with the mysterium cards so yeah that works yeah 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 i mean but but the they're on their reputations alone yeah they have a bunch of other games in there um that are excellent and they've won various awards so I can see why Asmodee wanted to pick them up there's obviously some talent at that company before we go we'd like to give a little shout out to our executive producers the Lucky Sparrow Gaming Cafe who are back open we would thoroughly encourage you if you are in Glasgow or in the area to go and give them a visit buy a drink have a sit play a game Jamie, Jamie, you visited them the other day. How they, how they do? I went down the other day to say hello uh, because you know they give us money, and I'm eternally grateful to them for that. And it's good they've got, as I said, they've got social distance, social distancing measures in place, but also means to play a game while maintaining a degree of uh, distancing and separation. Yeah, they're they're doing a great job. So yeah, please do go and support them if you can. You can also support us through our Patreon, but there are other ways to support us as well. Jamie, have you ever wanted? New dice, shiny, I mean, shiny new dice. Everybody wants shiny new I, dice. I mean, right? I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm a role player, and one of the symptoms of role playing is uncontrolled need to always get dice, no matter how many dice you have, and no matter if you use the same dice again and again and again, you always want more. Yeah, d six ophelia. It's a well known condition. Well, what wouldn't you love dice that you could throw at a man and knock him unconscious? Uh, in a game, yes. In reality. No, but I'm guessing you've got some. What I, are they made of? I, I do it well. These ones, these ones are made of nickel and plated with zinc, and they are from Met- Metallic Dicey Games. And if you are very good, you can go to their site and get a little discount off them, off their dice and various other accessories on there. They've got all sorts of dice and dice related things on there. You can get ten percent off with our discount code Roll with Brains. That's all uppercase, all one word. Roll with brains, R O L L W I T H B R A I N S. We'll obviously put that in the show notes as well. Uh, we get a little cut of that as well, so it helps us out as well. And uh, yeah, they're very, very good quality. I've got a little sample here beside me right now, and yeah, they're very nice. Oh, Ian, Ian, can you can you uh, give them a little shake and hold them up to the the mic? Oh, hold. oh, oh, oh! Things are falling over. Ooh. They're so metally. Ooh. Ooh, metallic. Ian, Ian, it's it's okay. It's okay. I think the I think the news arsenal dampener is uh, calming down. It means my accent can go back to normal. Hello there. Do, do you mean that you've employed a lot of interns to sort things out? How dare you? I'm a miracle worker, and I have got some fresh hot outro news for you that has nothing to do with Monopoly. Well, th- that's just not good enough. Well, tough. Take it up The only Monopoly the... news we found this week was fake. <laughs> yes. Take it up with my union representative. Anyway, we have... You have a union? I have... I have some news about a documentary that is available to rent and buy on iTunes. This is not an endorsement for Apple. This is an endorsement for the documentary called Game Master from director Charles Mruz and the studio is Gravitas Ventures. Game Master is a documentary about board games and the people who make them and the difficulties of getting games published. Now, the documentary follows four new aspiring board game designers and creators attempting to get into the industry and get their game published. Alongside that, there's interviews with board game design alumni, including Reiner Knizia, designer of oh so many games. All the games. So many games. All the games. <laughs> uh, Eric Lang, of course, of Blood Rage and Rising Sun. Nashra Balamganwala, designer of Arranged, about a game about arranged marriage. And Matt Leacock designer of the Pandemic series and the Forbidden series. That's Island, Desert, and Skies, not Stars. And now the, uh, it is available to rent or buy on iTunes, as I said. Have a little look at it. Check it out. It's quite good, I tell you. Good clarification on the Forbidden there. Nice. Like it. Good. Yeah, because I occasionally go, oh, these Forbidden games, like Forbidden Skies, Forbidden Deserts, Forbidden Stars. No, wait. 
Not Forbidden Stars. Didn't go quite get time for a Vox Pop this time because we didn't get our news doc sorted out in time, but we'll be putting a call out for that for the next one, hopefully. So keep an eye out on our Twitter and Facebook feeds and you can get involved in the cast by responding to some questions through audio. We just ask you to record them on a phone or if you've got a rig at home, record it a little bit nicer. Uh, but we'll put out instructions for that a little closer to the time in about a week or so when we're preparing the next cast. For just now, thanks very much for listening. Uh, if you like what you've listened to, then the best way to help us out is to share the podcast and drop us a review and rating on iTunes. And please do that if you've got the time. Uh, it just really helps us out to drop us a quick rain. Just put five stars in there. Everything's fine. You can also follow us on Twitter at The Giant Brain. Our Instagram is Giant Brain UK. Just search The Giant Brain on Facebook and you'll find us. Our website is giantbrain.co.uk. And you can email us about any bits of news you got or any comments you'd like us to read out on various news articles from previous shows at giantbrainuk at gmail.com. We'll be back next time, hopefully with a full cast. Uh, we'll find Ian somewhere underneath all this paper, probably. He, he's he, Look, he, he'll be fine. Don't worry about him. Don't worry about him. I'll go looking for him. I think there's a tube coming out of that bit of paper over there. I think it might be a breathing hole. Maybe he's, he, un- maybe he's, he's under there. He's ever so resourceful. Yeah. He's ever so resourceful. Yeah, it seems to be made out of biros. So, yeah. Yeah. Good. As I said, resourceful. Very resourceful. Goodbye. See you later.